So in Bluetooth, so this is a big word, but everybody needs them and everybody wants to know what they are. And uh, lots of people ask me all the time, how do I compute in Bluetooth? What do I do with in Bluetooth? And the problem we have is that not everybody thinks the same thing of inductance. So what I'm going to try to do is um, the, uh, we'll, we'll see what the inductance uh, means. So it refers to a characteristic of a coil in magnetic circuit or the magnetic circuit. Sometimes they're up in there. Okay? So it, has, it qualifies a coil, we can say. Uh, the meaning of the inductance differs depending on the people. Some people use it to just characterize elements, uh, yeah, any type of equipment. I'm doing, a, you know, I have a machine and I have this type of inductance. Some people use it to control a machine, so they're going to measure maybe the inductance as they do the control, or the rate of change of flux, and we'll see that it's directly related to the inductance. Some use it in a design tool. Uh, they know that they want to have this inductance for a certain point. Or sometimes you use this also in an equivalent circuit. So all of those are pretty much the same. Uh, but we'll see that sometimes the uh, information is a little different. In reality also, so we can compute them in many ways, but we can also measure them in, in very different ways. Some people do a step response, some people do a little AC, uh, AC signal. Uh, in any case, what I'm going to do here is try to look at a different way to compute a coil or a reactor, whatever you want to call it. So let's just talk about some symbols because we're going to see them a little after. We're going to have the inductance, those are in Henry. We have the voltage in volt. We have the little i, which is the line of current for me. We have the larger i, or the number of turns, okay? The i, which is just the ni, the total number of turns. We have the reluctance of the magnetic circuit the flux linking one turn, and then the total flux, not total linkage flux in the coil, and the magnetic energy. So let's look at how we talk about of inductance. So here what we have is uh, we have a curve where I do have the current this direction, and the flux linkage. So just imagine a coil, and what I'm doing is I'm ramping the current and so it gives me the structure case. So what you can see is that this is for a problem where we have a magnetic circuit which is non-linear. Okay? So we can see there is a non-linearity in my curve. If it were linear, I'd have just a straight line. Okay? So inductance, it's actually the rate of change of the magnetic flux with respect to a change of the coil, a current in the coil. So it means if I add a little um, current, the inductance will allow it to change into flux. So we can actually get this as being basically the flux divided by the current. Or better, because it's a change of rate, so it's basically the derivative of the flux to the current. I think this is the best definition of inductance. Unit is in energy, so in fact if we look at uh, how all of this is done, Inductance is sometimes also referred as the number, the total flux linkage divided by the current. So it's basically weather per turn per amps, okay? Same as the Henry. Or it's also the N5 can be uh, the volt second turns <coughs> divided by amperes. <coughs> Just to set the things here. So, other things. The inductance also is proportional to uh, the uh, square of the number of turns. Okay? And it's inversely uh, proportional to, uh, to the reluctance of the circuit. So, which means that uh, uh, depending on the, the reluctance is highly depending on the saturation. So, again, here we find the non linearity that exists here. It is also proportional to the energy stored in the domain. So, this is always the same quantity. So, so, which means that uh, we can also define, actually the energy is one half of Li squared. So, it's directly related to whatever uh, energy I can store in the domain, given a certain shape or circuit. Uh, we can also think of the inductance as being the electrical inertia. What is it? It's actually going to limit the rate, uh, the, the, the increase of voltage when the current changes. It's kind of a, a choke or something that uh, holds back the, the change in the voltage. 
And um, in frequency domain, and uh, actually I didn't go to the end of this one because it's, uh, it goes a little further and too far from me. Uh, but it's also, if you do the frequency domain, it's actually something that limits the bandwidth. So it means that uh, once you get to a certain frequency, this inductance will actually cut off the, uh, the frequencies that are higher. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how we compute using flux, finite limit, the inductance in those different ways on a little reactor. So this is just a little reactor. We have an axisymmetric geometry. We have a center pole in here. Uh, it's closed by a magnetic circuit. I put a little tuning gap here. I can adjust the gap to actually get whatever inductance I want. And I have a coil. So some idea about the sizes. From here to here, it's about 15 millimeters. From here to here, it's about 6 millimeters. The total height from here to here is 20 millimeters. Uh, I think the thickness here is uh, just about 3 millimeters. So, of course, uh, because of the axis symmetry, uh, we can just get a smaller uh, outer leg here. The length of the gap is 1 millimeter. And uh, just to do the solver, uh, to do the solving, well, just think this is going to be done uh, for <coughs> coal, which is made of 60 turns of coppers. And in fact, yeah. The problem will be solved for open boundaries, which in this case doesn't mean very much because we will see that no flux is going out of there. So whether we have open boundary or not doesn't mean anything. Uh, because we do finite elements, so let's talk about the elements. Uh, this is meshed in a little different way because I want to have a very good computation of the linkage flux. So what I did is I put quad element, quadratic element, if you remember. Quadratic element lead to a better, uh, a better uh, computation because uh, it's second order element, so we have actually eight, nine nodes in uh, in an element. And here inside the air gap, we also put some quadratic elements. So at the end, we have 72 quad elements. They're right there and here, and we have uh, about 3,000 triangular elements. So it's it's a very small problem, and you will see that it actually solves very much, very fast. We end up with uh, 66,258 nodes. As I said, not very big. So let's look at these, those different inductances that we talked before. So the first way I can compute is say, OK, the linkage, the flux linkage is the inductance multiplied by the uh, line current. So that's the total flux linkage. Huh? So the n is already included here. So then L is phi divided by i. Sometimes people call this the linear inductance. Why? Because it's just the slope, and it's not really, you know, it's if you if you can compute it when you have no saturation. If you go far away, the result is going to be far from anything you are looking for. This one here is called sometimes the local inductance. So it's L d phi d i. So that's just incremental. Oh, that's what's silly. Uh, did I? How do I do uh, the, the, the green again? Is this it? Sorry. No. 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 It's yeah. not this, but I, I hit the button here. Maybe blank I hit or something like this. Ah, yeah, computer. Thank you. Jerry, you're my savior. <laughs> okay, I said uh, this one here, let's make sure I don't do the mistake again. This one is the local inductance. And uh, so it means it's going to be true wherever you are on the curve. 
of course, that means that this one and this one should be exactly the same right at the start, where you almost, when you're linear. That's another way. So if we evaluate the energy, we should be able to compute two times the energy and divide it by the square of the current, which will give us uh, the uh, inductance. Then we have the step response. So basically what we do, we're going to put a step voltage. We're going to look at the uh, current moving. And when we get 63.2% of the current, that's about 1 over E, huh? uh, then uh, it's, going to give me, it's going to give me the time constant of, the, uh, of my circuit. And uh, T, the time constant is actually L divided by R. So the inductance is just going to be R multiplied by the time constant. And then at the end, I can put a little AC signal. I put whatever frequency, it doesn't really matter. Usually, you put it small so that there is no saturation. And if I do this, then I get uh, that uh, V is equal to R plus G L omega I. And out of there, using complex operation, I can actually deduct R and L. So let's do it. So we're going to actually solve we're going to solve a linear case. The first thing is I do only linear case because I want to verify that everything I've said is correct. Okay, so I'm going to put a mu of I think 2000 inside the, uh, the core and I'm solving. So I'm going to solve for the current varying and I'm going to see what's happening. And then once I have, uh, once I have computed, it's very easy in flux to compute the, uh, uh, oh no, this is, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's very easy in flux to compute the flux linkage. You basically say, okay, compute uh, new 2D curves. Uh, you say for the variation of the current, then you select the circuit, then it opens to you this new window, and then you say, okay, this is the name of my coil, and compute the flux. Basically, I'm going to compute the flux inside the coil named source. And once I do this, that's what it is. Okay, this is a linear case. Huh? I said it's linear. So we are hoping to see only a straight line. Good. Huh? Not difficult. So I can take any point along this line. So I'm taking one here. This is uh, 24.87 uh, amps. This is uh, 20.77 uh, milli Webers. Uh, it's actually the flux. Uh, milli, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, this. And uh, so if I do phi divided by i, I find an inductance which is 0.835 milli henrys. Okay, first, quick, first computation, phi divided by i. Now I can take this curve, and in flux I have the possibility to derivate this curve. So if I have a, a curve, which here I call flux image, it's the it's linkage, it's the curve you just saw before. What I can do now, I can say derivative of the curve, and flux will plot for me the derivative of the curve. So how is this curve going to look like? It's, it's an horizontal constant curve, because of course we have a constant inductance. And indeed, here it is. And so if I take the value on the point here, well, look at this, 0.835 mini Henry. So in this case, those two methods are, are not giving the same value. Of course, because we are linear, we will see after further that when we are nonlinear, it's not the same anymore. So let's go with the energy. So again, in flux, it's very easy. I can ask for a new 2D curve. I'm going to take uh, versus the current. This is the current I have uh, uh, made uh, solved. And uh, uh, the uh, value I get for the region, I'm selecting the region domain. And I'm asking for the energy, which is actually in joules, OK? And I'm computing this uh, curve. And of course, this curve is going to be a straight line again, because we are linear. Actually, it's not a straight curve, because it varies like the square of the curve, OK? So I can take any point along this curve. Here I have a value of a current, which is 27.64. It gives me the energy, which is about 319. Uh, millijoule, and if I do actually two times this energy divided by the square of the current, guess what? I find the same. 835, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8
we are in linear. So that's really good. So let's do another one. Oh, by the way, yes, you can compute. You don't have to do the, the division like I did, but you can do it directly. So when you do a curve, you can actually enter the formula. So right here, I'm calculating the energy of the domain time 2 divided by the square of the current. And of course, it gives me a straight line. And it's the 835, 0.835 millihenry. And you can see it's a 0.9 after. And it's, uh, it's what it is. OK, now we're going to do the step response. So I'm putting a voltage source in series with my coil. I'm putting a voltage here of 5 volts. The resistance of the coil, I mean the resistance of the coil here is 0.5 volt. This is just uh, the value for the uh, 60 turns of copper with the dimension of the, of the wire I took. So I'm going to solve between 0 and 7.5 t to the minus 3. I'm going to ask for 200 times samples. Remember we have about 68 or 6900 uh, uh, nodes. It takes less than a minute to do those 200 times steps, so quite fast. And here we go. So this is the current. We have the current here and the time. So now I need to find the uh, total current. By the way, I don't have to compute it because I put 5 volts. Huh? And I have a, a resistance which is 0.5, so the total current should be 10. Okay? Uh, the DC current. So I'm actually taking then 63.2 percent, and you know this is this is why this was was not very smart. It's actually 10 normally, but it doesn't really matter. It's going to serve my purpose. 63.2 percent. Remember, this is the uh, one over E constant, and so that gives me a current of 6.254 amps. And if I put 6.254 amps here, I'm looking here. And I'm going to get the time here, and the time is for 1.66 10 to the minus 3 seconds. Okay, that's picked on the curve. So the inductance, remember, is resistance times this time constant. And look, this is the resistance, 0.5 ohms, the time constant, and what do I get? 0.832 millihenry. So it was 0.835. Why is there a difference? Because the guy who did this forgot that the DC, the DC current was 10 amps and not 9.88, but okay. Now let's do the other one. Now we're going to do an AC signal. So what am I doing? I'm, I'm just going to put a little, uh, so we solve in AC steady state. So it's a complex formulation. Uh, we, we, set, we solve for the phasor diagram. We have the voltage, we have the magnitude at a phase, okay? And uh, so, same external circuit as before, we're going to take a frequency of 50 Hz, we can take 60, we can take 100, it doesn't matter. When you have this kind of stuff, you actually have a sampling frequency, and probably it's more often 200 than anything else, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the voltage source, we're going to put 1 volt. Remember I told you when we do this kind of stuff, we try to do a very low voltage, so there is no saturation. Well, of course, here we are linear, so it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to put uh, 1 volt. And uh, in result, so I'm solving this. And when it's solved, I can actually compute the current that goes through the coil. And you can see that it gives me the complex value, so I have the real part, imaginary part. And then I have the magnitude of the current, and then I have the uh, the phase angle. Okay. And by the way, we could we could compute. We have we can compute with the uh, uh, the, the operation of the of the complex number, but we could also use a phase. You know, use a cosine phi. It would be the same. So in any case, here I decided to do it this way. So the real value. Remember, uh, we take. Uh, the voltage multiplied by the conjugate of the current divided by the current multiplied by the uh, conjugate of the current. So the voltage is going to be the real part of this. And so if we look at the real part, actually I don't have the, the multiplication here, but it doesn't matter. So it's, I did it somewhere else. Inside flux, you can actually enter this formula. Okay? And so it's the real part of the real part is actually 2.86 to 5.73, which is the uh, uh, the, the square of the uh, magnitude, actually. And then uh, it's uh, 0.5. 
hole, which is it's good. I'm finding exactly the resistance I put in. So again, it's consistent. And then if I go look for the L, so L is going to be this uh, complex impedance, this imaginary impedance, divided by 1 over omega. And if you remember, actually I did a mistake. It's a 50 here. So see, uh, it's called not being consistent. Uh, and uh, L is 1 over 1.8 divided by uh, 5.73, and I think it was actually 60 hertz, divided by 2 pi 60, and that gives me 0.835 10 to the minus 3. So I took five different methods, and those five different methods led to the exact same value because I'm linear. So all method gives the same answer. This little this difference is because the, the, the full DC current was not done. No, this is a step report response. And if you remember, I took 9.88x when I should have taken 10. So this method seems to be equivalent. I look at it and I say, well, it's all good. It's all the same. It must be the same. But now we're going to do this same computation for a nonlinear non -linear case. And so now the material will be a 1010 steel. So it's a nonlinear uh, steel. And this is the curve, the BH curve. Right? We have H here and B here. That gives you the characteristic of the curve. Nonlinear, no questions there. So, first thing I'm going to do. Oh, sorry. So, I'm just looking first at the flux density map just to make sure that I do have saturation and things like this. I'm ramping the current from 0 to 50, okay, no? So at 10 amps, this is the uh, map I have. I'm going from 0 to 2 uh, Tesla. So we can see uh, there is almost no saturation, maybe except maybe in the corner here and in the corner here. But I cannot say no saturation, but there is not very much, okay? If I go 20 amps, now we can see there is a big part of the leg which is at 2 Tesla, okay? So we can see there is indeed uh, some change in the flux density. Now let's look at the permeability distribution. And I can plot this in flux. I'm just asking for the, uh, for the uh, relative permeability. 2,000 is actually the initial slope of this material, or just about 2,000. And 1 is the air. Okay? So here you can see 2,000. Uh, none of this is really saturated. Remember this little corner we had before? We do confirm it's saturated. And here it's saturated. And here it's somewhere in the middle. So it's not 2,000, but it's still closer to 1,000. This is at 10, or it's, this is a 10 amp. Now this is a 20 amp, and look at this part. This is definitely completely saturated in the, in the middle. Okay. So I do have saturation. Now I can actually see how the, the inductance is going to vary with the saturation. First thing, the flux linkage. So if you remember before, the flux linkage was straight. Okay? And uh, now you can see the nonlinearity. So by the way, now if you actually think about it, if I do phi divided by i, which is called the linear inductance, you can see that maybe somewhere around here it's always the same value. But if I go here, I definitely have different slopes. And those slopes have nothing to do with the rate of growing the flux. So phi divided by i for me doesn't mean anything. It's really not a value that, that has a meaning what, whatsoever. In any case, so let's see what we get. So in fact here, this is the phi divided by i. And you can do this directly in flux because you can enter the, uh, the formula, say compute the inductance and divide by the current. So here it is. We start here and start to go down. And here I think it's somewhere around the, uh, let's see, this is 5, 7, I think it's close to 800 or something like this. So it's a little lower than the other one because I think the uh, initial slope, what the slope I have taken for the other one was different. But you can see how this inductance keep changing and going down, which is good. It's supposed to change. But uh, what you're going to see is that if I take another value, so the next one I'm going to take is d phi d i. Same as before. I took the curve and I derivated versus the current. Exactly like I did for the linear. Guess what? This is the linear inductance. This is the d phi d i. 
now we can see those structures are completely different. Now, if you use those values here to do your control, I'm sorry, but you're really in trouble. Because the controller, this is what he sees. He doesn't see this part. Okay? So this is the defined EI. And you can see, by the way, this is also correct, that once we are getting to saturation, uh, very highly saturated, but the slope stays almost the same because we, we're extending toward the, the air permeability. Well, what about the energy? Maybe the energy is good. I don't know. Well, here we go. So the energy is somewhere between the linear inductance and the local inductance. Okay? But there is something which is reassuring, and that is that if I look here right at the beginning, I do get the same value. So that means I'm probably correct in all those things. Those things. So, but when I look at those one, I personally believe this is the one which is correct for the control. Some people use this one. I don't know that it is so good. So if I do the detail right at the beginning, now you can see my three, this is phi divided by i, this is the energy, and this is the d phi d i. And you can see up to whatever it is, uh, one and something else. I almost have no saturation. And indeed, those three curves are together. OK? So now let's go a little further and do the step response. Now, the bad part with the step response is that I'm going to be able to compute inductance for whatever current I'm doing. So if I do 5 volt, I can only compute for 10 amps because this is what the total current is, okay? If I want to do more than, if I want to do less, so I put maybe one, uh, 0.5 volt, and it's gonna be for one amp. Okay, you have to try to think about this. So, here it's two, it's uh, non-linear. I'm doing 200 times samples, but this, the time is a little longer, why? Because it's non-linear, so it has to do some iteration. So it's, you know, it was one minute before, and now it's about two minutes, so whatever. Okay. And so if I, and here it was smart, the uh, DC current is 10 amps, 63.2% of the DC current occurs at 1.69 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So I'm coming here, so see, because 6.32, I'll find it here. I'm coming here, getting the time. And if I get this inductance, I'm going to get 0.845 E minus 3. So now I need to see where it goes on the curve. So I'm going to look at 10 F's. This is 10 F's. And we said 0.845, is this right? 0.845 midi Henry. So if I go look at this one here, uh, the linear inductance, which is this one here, if I go and take the value here, it's 0.818, 10 to the minus 3. The energy one, this is uh, 0.8. 5 mini Henry, and this is the local inductance, 0.764. That's actually a little unnerving because I was hoping to get the one I computed with the time response somewhere in between all of those. But no, it's a little higher. Okay? I'm still sticking with this one actually. Okay? So that's uh, for the nonlinear. I haven't done the AC. So why? Uh, well, because I run out of time, and this is going to be something I'm going to plan to actually extend on as we go along. But if I do the AC, what's what do I have to do? Well, when you want to compute the inductance, you want to actually compute the AC voltage on top of the saturated image. I don't want to actually get the whole variation. So. The real thing that I would have to do, and that's very easy to do with flux, is first compute a DC problem. A DC problem which is actually set for the value of the current that I'm going to do. So I want to go for 10 amps. I'm going to compute the DC problem for the 10 amps. That's going to give me a saturation picture. I'm going to freeze the permeability and use this as a, as a property for the AC. And then I'm exporting the frozen new permeability. Then I apply the small voltage with the, uh, with the frequency. 
And now I can do the computation exactly as I did for the linear case or any of the other cases. Okay? Now, if there is a permanent in magnet in the circuit, the only one that will give you any kind of accurate information is actually, well, the two, is actually the uh, incremental inductance, so it's the d phi di. Why? Because the permanent magnet is going to push a flux through the coil. If you do phi divided by i, what you have is not the flux of the current, but you get the flux of the current plus the flux of the parent magnet. Now if you do d phi di, so I take two values of phi, two value of i, I'm cancelling out the constant, the, uh, if the, the parent magnet flux is constant. So if I do d phi di, it goes away. And the only variation of flux I get is actually the variation due to the current. So I can apply it directly. The step response same ID actually, or is it? Yeah, it's the same ID because it's a, the current that goes through, same thing. Any of the others, what I would have to do is first compute the problem, maybe just with the permanent magnet. What it's going to do is that it's going to set the, the, uh, the, the saturation picture of the device. If you don't do this and you remove the magnet, you won't have the right to permeability. So the, the quantity will be wrong. So you first compute the DC, freeze the permeability, you just export them through table, then you remove the magnetic field, you basically remove the BR, but you need to keep the mu of the magnet huh? because it plays in the reluctance of the circuit. And then you process exactly the same as for the linear case. 